In this video, I'll show you everything you need to know about using the built-in sprite collisions for the Playdate SDK, including how to use collision responses to make different collision interactions, pros and cons of using this over another collision implementation, and more, starting right now. The sprite collision system I'm referring to is a built-in way to add a bounding rectangle to any sprite and use it to do simple detection and collisions. If you don't know what a sprite is in the context of the Playdate, I recommend checking out my last video on the basics of the Playdate SDK. To add a collision rect, first, Take your sprite instance and define a collision rectangle using set collision rect. The first two parameters are where you want the rectangle to start. If you put in 0, 0, the rectangle will start drawing from the top left of the sprite. But let's say you want it to be more centered, like making a smaller hitbox for the player. You can set it to something else and it will start drawing from there. The last two parameters are width and height values for how wide and tall the rectangle should be. The function getSize is convenient here as it returns two values, the width and height of the sprite. So you can use that instead to just set the collision rect to the size of the sprite. The collision rect isn't bounded to the dimensions of the sprite in any way, so you can make it bigger than the sprite, and also you can use negative numbers for the x and y values to start drawing the collision rect outside the bounds of the sprite. In other examples you may have seen, sprites are moved with the move to function. However, this indiscriminately moves the sprite to that location without taking collisions into consideration at all. For that, you need to use move with collisions, which takes in two parameters, which are the x and y coordinates that you're targeting. But depending on if a collision happens, the sprite's final position may not be the same as the target. The function returns a few different values, like the actual x and y position, along with the collisions array that holds information like what the sprite collided with, the collision normal, the coordinates of where the collision happened, and more. This data can be used like knowing when the player touched the ground to refresh their jumps. There are four different collision responses, freeze, slide, bounce, and overlap. At first, it seems a bit confusing what they're actually doing, but it's actually pretty simple once broken down. They all deal with the response to when move with collisions attempts to move one collision rect into another one. For freeze, when a sprite with a collision rect is moved into another, it simply sets the final position of the sprite at the point of contact. This is perfect for sprites that should stop moving as soon as it collides with something, like an arrow. I've set up this example with arrows that demonstrates this collision response. For slide, upon collision, the system takes the angle and magnitude of entry into the other object and translates that into a movement along the side of the object. This is useful for things that should slide over others, like a character and a platformer. If we run the arrow example with slide this time, you can now see that the arrows slide along the side of the collision rect. Of course, for the arrow that was shot completely straight, there is no sideways movement, so there's nothing to translate into a slide. For bounce, upon collision, the system takes the angle and magnitude of entry and simply reflects it over the surface that it was collided with. This is useful for things that should move away from each other upon collision, like a ball in Pong or Arkanoid. If we again apply this to the arrow example, you can see that the arrows start bouncing. However, since in the code there is still a rightward movement being applied to the arrow, it will keep bumping into the wall. If you want to do something like change directions, you'll have to respond to the collision event in some way with the information received from the move with collision return values or somewhere else. Here, I've reversed the movement direction and rotated the sprite on contact with the wall. Lastly, for overlap, the collision will not impact the movement of the sprite at all, but the system still detects the collision. This is useful for things like picking up a coin. The way you define these collision responses is by using the collision response function. The function takes in one parameter, other, which is whatever you've collided with, and what you return is the collision type. You can use these constants or just the strings slide, freeze, overlap, and bounce. If the function isn't implemented, the default response is freeze. Of course, you can dynamically change the response based on what the other is. My recommendation is to extend the sprite class into a new subclass with the extend, and use the isA function to tell what kind of object it is. If that doesn't make any sense to you, let me know in the comments and I can make a video about object-oriented programming for the playdate. What if you want to be able to specify if something is able to interact with something else? This is where collision groups come into play. A group is a collection of sprites that should have similar collision behavior. For example, maybe all the enemies in the game have the same group. So when the enemy attacks, the attacks don't affect any other enemies, only the player. There are 32 possible groups, represented by the integers 1 through 32. You can set what a group a sprite is part of using the setGroups function. If it's a singular group, you can just pass in one number, but if a sprite should be part of multiple groups, you can pass in a list of groups like so. To specify what groups the sprite should be able to collide with, you can use the function setCollidesWithGroups in the same way. The system checks if the group of one sprite and the collide with group of another to see if they should interact. If a sprite isn't part of any group, and another sprite doesn't have any collides with groups, those two sprites will still interact. 
In the arrow example, I've set up all the arrows to be in group 1 with no collides with groups. The wall has no collision group, so while the arrows don't collide with each other, they do collide with the wall. If I remove the arrows from their group, you can see that they start stacking, but also it starts to have a performance impact as the system has to calculate a bunch more collisions. You can manually check for overlapping sprites using the overlapping sprites function, which returns a list of all the sprites that overlap the sprite that this function is called on, or you can get a list of all the sprites that are overlapping using sprite.allOverlappingSprites. Additionally, you can check collisions on a per pixel basis using the alpha collision function. It returns whether or not the non-transparent pixels of two sprites are overlapping. You can see in this example that when the player is overlapping the collision rect, the system detects a collision, but not an alpha collision. However, when the non-transparent pixels overlap, it is now considered an alpha collision as well. You can also query for sprites in a certain point, rect, and along a line using the query sprites at point, query sprites in rect, and query sprites along line respectively, which seem pretty useful. Maybe querying along a line can be used for a simple raycasting implementation. While the built-in collision library is useful, it's not a great fit for every situation. Of course, the library is already integrated with the sprite library, which makes it very easy to plug into your game. It also handles tunneling, which is an issue where if an object moves too quickly between frames, it might skip past the collision rect. However, it only handles axis-aligned bounding box collisions. This means that you can only use rectangles for collision detection and no other shapes. Also, it must be axis-aligned, which means you can't rotate it. You can see here while the asteroids rotate, the collision rect stays in the same orientation. This makes the collision detection faster, but at the cost of flexibility. This makes this ideal for tile-based games, where most entities can be represented with axis-aligned rectangles. Games that require some physics, but not a full realistic simulation, along with some other genres, which include, but are not limited to, top-down games similar to The Legend of Zelda, shoot'em ups, and simple platformers. Examples of games that this library would not be ideal for include, but are not limited to, ones that require polygons for collision detection, or games that require highly realistic physics simulations, like with things stacking up a lot or rolling over each other. If this has been helpful to you, leave a like to let me know so I know to make more of this type of video. Subscribe to see more Playdate content. I upload every week on Monday. See you next time.